Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 19 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my partner in crime. Well, not crime. Partner in partner in peace. That sounds better. Yeah, there you go. That sounds kind of hippie-ish. Partner in, partner in stuff. Professor Ahmed is here anyway. That's my point. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be here, Zaki. Yeah. Um, yeah By very- next time, we will have worked out a title. For, for whatever it is that we're doing here. I don't know. But I'm very excited uh, to be doing this. And this is, as I said, this is our 19th episode. And we are joined by a guest we've been wanting to have on for a little while now. And she is Sana Amanath. And uh, Sana is, uh, is an editor at Marvel Comics. She's been in the publishing industry for the past nine years. She currently works at Marvel, developing and managing creative content for their various publishing lines. She's worked on Ultimate Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, Elektra, Hawkeye, uh, and, of course, Ms. Marvel the first Muslim character to headline a, a superhero comic, so pretty big deal, uh, and she helped co-create that character. She also serves as Young Leadership Committee board member at the Seeds of Peace, uh, an organization that promotes the empowerment of youth in regions of conflict. So, Sana, just to start things out, you r- were recently given a, a pretty big promotion at Marvel, and I uh, would love to know what, what, the, what that entails. You're, you're a creative uh, content director, is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, the title, official title is Director of Content and Character De- Development, which is, go. Marvel Marvel is a fan of long titles that <laughs> sound impressive. <laughs> uh, the trick now is I actually have to do something impressive with it. Um, there's a few different aspects to the new position. I'll still be working on a few titles um, and doing some uh, development work in terms of, you know, creating content that is geared um, towards like these newer audiences that are emerging and trying to find ways to, um, you know, tell unique stories that will open us up to, um, more, more people being interested in comics. I feel like right now what's happening is that there's such a resurgence in, in comic book fandom and we're getting such a diverse audience out there. And I truly believe, you know, me being someone who really started reading comic, superhero comic books pretty late in life, that comic books can be for everyone and anyone. If you're interested, uh, Marvel should have a comic book out there for you. Um, so that's sort of one aspect of my job. The other one is, um, much more IP development across our uh, across our company line. So I'll be working a little bit more closely with um, our uh, our animation division, TV, live action, um, games, and and uh, our studios. Just making sure that we're we're sort of all on the same page in terms of what the vision messaging is for our our newer franchises. Um, so that's that's which is great because now we can sort of you know, the, the ultimate goal is trying to sort of broaden our franchises that uh, ultimately starts reaching, you know, these, the sort of larger mainstream audiences. So, well, I think it's safe to say that right now, certainly you're, you're one of the most visible faces uh, that, that's uh, at Marvel right now. And, and you've, you've been involved with a lot of very high profile stuff there. And I, I, I want to unpack some of that. But before we do that, uh, tell us about your own narrative. I mean, how, how did you end up here? I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> um, it's, Your origin stories, as it were. Yeah, yeah exactly. Every, every, every Sunday morning. And uh, after a long week, I always wonder how I got here. Um, <laughs> it, You know, it's a lot of it was happenstance. A lot of it was, um, you know, me having sort of certain intentions. You know, fundamentally, I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to, um, when I was really young, uh, you know, and, and a lot of this I kind of covered in my TED Talk, really sort of the perception of, you know, Muslim Americans, of women of color, um, really negatively influenced like my own self perception in terms of who I was, who I was allowed to be, who I wanted to be, and um, it became a struggle for me to really sort of find out, you know, what my own identity was on my own terms because I was so influenced by what you know my family said, what my friends have said, what the media told me about what it meant to be a Muslim American woman. Um, and even, I, even still, I think I struggle with it to an extent. Uh, but 
I think, you know, when you're talking about sort of the role of Muslims in America and how they're perceived, I very much wanted to be a journalist to be like, oh, I want to share our story. I want to tell people this is not how Muslims are. Like, let's really dig deep and start showing like more dimensions to who uh, what it means to be a Muslim and, and also what it means to be an American. Um, so I was like, yeah, duh, journalist, it's going to happen. <laughs> and um, I ended up, uh, I think I was poli-sci major, Middle Eastern studies minor. Um, oh. and, yeah, and at some point I, I, um, I started freelancing. I worked in publishing for a while. And it just, you know, it, it was hard because I feel like something was missing. There was a creative link missing to that. And I realized I wanted to not just cover other people's stories, try to create my own. Mm. And simultaneously... Um, you know, this, this job at a small indie comic book company came and, uh, Virgin Comics. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. I've, oh, I've yeah. heard of it. Yeah. 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 So I got a job there and, um, the cool thing about the comics industry is once you're in it, uh, you just get to meet a lot of people within the industry. And I met a lot of people at Marvel. I really learned about the sort of creative process of comic book storytelling, and it just fit. It was one of those things where I understood how to art direct artists, um, how to work with writers and develop their content. And the creative collaboration is something that very much excites me. Um, and it was just another reminder to me that, like, you don't necessarily have to sit and talk and lecture people. You can share your experiences um, through these diverse narratives that you put out there. Uh, so, and comic books in particular, uh, because of sort of the, the, the sort of supreme ideals that they try to uphold, um, which makes it even more, all the more empowering when you're trying to tell those stories. Uh, so yeah, so that sort of, you know, met a bunch of Marvel people and I ended up getting my, uh, my first job at Marvel about six years ago now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so like, um, you, you, uh, more specifically, uh, I imagine like, like us, you sort of were born to an immigrant family from the subcontinent or. Yeah. Yeah. So my parents okay. were, um, my parents were born in like Pakistan, India, India, really. And then they right. met Pakistan sort of the very typical story of, Oh, you're Indian. How is that possible? I'm like, <laughs> we're all kind of Indian. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And they, they have a great story because they came to they they went to undergrad in AUB in Beirut American Univers University in Beirut, um, and then from there they didn't they met each other but they didn't really re meet each other until they both happened to be in New York for the World's Fair in 1964 in New York oh, City. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, re met. So they came here even pre 1965, sort of you know the the sort of immigrant influx. It's crazy. It's a very yeah. specific small community that actually was here around that time, and yeah. they all know each other. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. Yeah. So my parents are my my dad was at Columbia University, and they met and um, you know raised a really large, beautiful, extended family. We have a lot. I have a lot of cousins here now, and um, very much uh, they started an Islamic center in New Jersey. Um, which is still there today. It's a really beautiful Islamic center. They put their lives into it. Which um, one is this in particular? Uh, oh. It's called the uh, American Islamic Academy in Boonton. Oh, I'm not. Oh, in, okay, okay. Yeah. In Boonton, New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, they're they're definitely pillars of the community. And I have three older brothers and a bunch of cousins. And you know, our way of you know, I was I was fasting during you know while I was playing track and had to go to prom by myself, made an outfit uh, of full length sleeves and long, like to my ankles skirt. And, you know, it, one of those things where I really owned being a Muslim, but uh, you know, it, it was a little bit, it was a little bit tough. It was a little bit difficult because um, I disagreed with a lot of what I was taught to an extent. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I, I firmly believe in the fact that I'm a Muslim and I'm uh, very proud of it. And I, I, I believe everything that my parents have taught in, the, uh, in, in terms of sort of the larger principles. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, f did not expect that I would end up being in comics because of that. Um, but yeah. 
So it's fascinating because I think in, 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 in some ways, I mean, the reason I even asked the question just to, well, for, for, for one, just to get that sort of background as well, uh, because, I mean, I mean, as we've sort of talked about on the show, uh, even when we talk about the American Muslim community, it's certainly not monolithic. So we all sort of have our own unique experiences. Uh, and, you know, there you go. I mean, your parents came here, uh, you know, almost uh, near, you know, like six, seven years before mine did. So uh, or, or perhaps Zuckies. Um, but it's it, what I find interesting with your story now and then the transition into Marvel is you're in a medium that is generally seen as being, I guess, prototypically male or male dominated. Right. And then, mm-hmm. and I don't mean just in terms of creative content, but mm-hmm. also in terms of like readership. Right. Sure, I mean, yeah. Uh, and then, and so that's one part of it. And then of course this, the other part, uh, equally important is the fact that you're, you're a Muslim woman. So, yeah. uh, I, I, maybe you can maybe unpack some of that a little bit. I mean, you grew up sort of reading comic books, which that itself I find fascinating. Well, I have three older brothers, so. And oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> one of them was a really big nerd. Um, but True. I actually, I actually started reading comic books, uh, superhero comic books much later. I think I was reading mostly like Archie and Calvin and Hobbes. Um, but yeah, I was, I was very much, I mean, I was drawing Garfield when I was, you know, like 10, 11 years old. So, um, I I was very much into that, but yeah, there is, there, there are a lot of layers to the fact that I happen to be like a lot of different minorities in one. Um, (laughs) and, uh, we joke around a, a lot about that. I am definitely in a male dominated industry, definitely in a white male dominated industry. And, I think a lot of people can say that uh, for a lot of what they do, you know, especially a lot of my friends. They're also in a lot of male-dominated industries. I mean, I, I'm a lawyer, and you can say that about law. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but there is something very uh, white male American about comic books yeah. um, in general. So uh, to be able to sort of go walk, walk into the doors of, of, of Marvel Comics and, um, you know, do the work that I'm doing and also having been able to actually uh, be able to pitch the projects I've pitched is sort of an anomaly. It doesn't really happen very often. Um, But I will say that I've had a lot of support and a Mm -hmm. lot of people in my corner and a lot of them, you know, one of them was my first mentor in comics. Um, The other one is like the, the, the publisher of Marvel uh, like Dan Buckley and Joe Quesada Mm -hmm who are big proponents of having more women, having more diverse voices and creators. And, you know, I remember Joe being like, Sana, like I know, and I had a lot of insecurities. I'll be very honest with you about going back into comics after my first job. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of doubt was put upon me in terms of, do you know what you're talking about? Do you really understand like comic book continuity? You know, what do you know? You're a girl. And Mm -hmm it was really hard. Like it, it affected me, um, on multiple levels. Cause I was like, I had a lot of doubt about whether or not I actually was good at this job. Um, and it wasn't until I was having conversations with like Dan Buckley, Joe Quesada. And they're, they're like, listen, like this is, we need your voice. Comics needs a voice like yours right now. Right now we are flat. There's, wow. we're telling one type of comic book story. We need people who aren't steeped in comic book continuity who are going to be able to come in and tell different types of stories. Um, and really like having that and then having people like, you know, Stephen Wacker, who was my senior editor, um, who really like gave me sort of the next level of, you know, this is, he, he was a big support in allowing us to even pitch Miss Marvel and doing all of those things that he's done. Um, so I, I think that that was important. I was very blessed in that way. And I, and that's why I, I really believe in mentorship. I really believe in supporting people that have talent. Um, and not to say that it's not difficult, not to say that I still don't have challenges, but ultimately like having a few people in your corner and having a few white men in your corner <laughs> is very important, uh, to, 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 to make sort of change for yourself. So, I mean, and, and it's, I mean, it, just in terms of, uh, uh, female editors who've been at Marvel, you're part of a very illustrious li- lineage when I think of like Bobby Chase and yeah. uh, Louise Simonson and, and Renee Witterstater. But I mean, I, I feel like uh, you, you've been there a relatively short time, but I mean, there you've, you've made uh, some very big moves mm-hmm. uh, within that short time. And I, and you alluded to Ms. Marvel, so I, yeah. I, I don't want to bury the lead there. I mean, uh, 
this is a character who's been embraced in a way that, and, I, and I'll just put it on Front Street, actually. Uh, when I first heard about the character, I was very excited. But when people asked me, well, what do you think? I said, well, I, I got to be honest, I don't, I don't know that there's going to be an audience for it. Yep, yep. And, and, and that's, uh, let, me, let me just admit to you and the world, I was <laughs> entirely wrong. But, I mean, my, my, the rationale yeah. for me coming from that is that the, the, the comic community, at least by, by my uh, estimation, is, it tends to sort of circle the wagons. There, there isn't a, a reflexive welcoming of, of new ideas or new concepts, and that's why you tend to see things go back to the way they have always been. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly with Ms. Marvel, actually, and, and actually before we even get to Ms. Marvel, because I think yeah. Ms. Marvel happened because of Captain Marvel, and I know you, you had some involvement mm-hmm. in that, the decision was made to take uh, Carol Danvers, who was the previous Ms. Marvel, and turn her into the, you know, bump her up, uh, turn her into Captain yeah. Marvel. Um, yeah. Was that a difficult transition to make? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to say, I really think Captain Marvel, um, and again, I want to just give a quick shout out to Stephen Wacker in particular, because he, that was very much like him and Kelly Sue's like mastermind in terms of realizing we got to make this character more modern and relevant. And, uh, you know, Stephen specifically was say, said, you know, we have to, I need to be able to create a comic book I can give to my daughter. Um, yes. And what does that mean? That means you should be able to give her a costume, a uniform rather, um, that is uh, reflective of her 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 prowess without diminishing her femininity. Um, yeah. And that's that's sort of where the uniform came from. That's sort of you know they chopped off her hair because it looked cool, not because they weren't trying to make a crazy statement about like long hair or anything. It was very much uh, a, a a visual creative decision. Um, but I, 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 that I think was very much at the forefront of, uh, some sort of change in, in the comic book audience and, um, what people started to expect out of their content. Um, definitely I think Captain Marvel was one of those series that one of those characters that got a lot of negative reaction, um, sort of also like Miles Morales also got a lot of negative reaction. I think, yeah, and, I mean, and 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 it might it might be worth filling in. Yeah, uh, uh, the, yeah uh, the Miles Morales uh, uh, tempest in a teapot, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so 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 he he was uh, created. Uh, now now actually maybe you can uh, you're you're on the inside. So maybe it, my understanding is that he was essentially created uh, as as a result of the controversy that erupted when Donald Glover expressed an interest in possibly playing Spider Man. Yeah, I mean, I think it was sort of in the atmosphere as it was. Um, and simultaneously, we were trying, I was actually, that's, that, I was an editor on those books at the time. Mm-hmm. And we were trying to figure out exactly what to do with Peter Parker's story in the Ultimate Universe. And it, mm-hmm. we just knew it was time to go. It was, it was time to refresh. Um, right. And sort of, the one thing I will say about Marvel, um, I mean, I'll say many things about Marvel, but <laughs> <laughs> very very good at sort of feeling the temperature of um, the the zeitgeist, if you will, and understanding what's important to an audience, understanding how to evolve your characters so that you're relevant to a modern audience. Um, And that's sort of what happened with Miles Morales. That's, uh, you know, uh, what happened, Miles Morales, who is the first African American uh, and Latino Spider-Man. And, what is uh, what happened with with uh, Carol Danvers as uh, becoming Captain Marvel? Um, yeah. So I, I do think that sort of the waves of change were happening, and simultaneously people started becoming more vocal and excited about comics. And you know, when you make a, a sort of statement like that in the comic books, for whatever reason, it has such, people have such a reaction to it because, huh. in my <laughs> mind. I think fundamentally superheroes like embody all of the ideals that we want as human beings, um, especially when you're talking about American ideals, but in particular about the best versions of ourselves that we aspire to be, these characters embody those principles. And so when you take these characters and you make them look like all of us, yeah. um, that is extremely exciting. And that starts giving a lot of hope to people who might not have felt represented. Um, and, 
who feel like, oh, wait, I have, uh, there's a superhero out there for me. That means mm. I can be a superhero. Um, mm. There's a lot of weird, like, psychological ramifications to having someone like Captain Marvel um, or Carol Danvers become Captain Marvel in a way that doesn't necessarily look like a typical superhero anymore. Mm. Um, and and I think that's why it was such an interesting time because these little sort of little ripples were happening. And I think Ms. Marvel happened to just create a wave and now it's just the momentum is going, it's nonstop. And um, it's, it's really, I, it's really interesting because I've been lucky enough to be a part of all of those um, little, little uh, big moments rather in, in comics. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I mean, uh, Ms. Marvel, t- tell us the story. Yeah. How, how did, how did that happen? Uh, you know, it was just a conversation with me, Steve Wacker, and um, I, me and him, we're very good friends now, and um, we'll just shoot the shit and talk about stuff, experiences I had growing up, and, you know, and I've t- told him all the times I'd be wearing tights underneath my shorts, playing lacrosse in, like, 80-degree weather, fasting while, you know, running track, and all these, like, crazy things, not a- being allowed to date, and, um, you know, and he's he's, like, a funny guy, like, you just very, very much like from the Midwest. And it's like, I don't understand your world. Like you, you can do what? Like you didn't kiss a boy. What? I don't understand. Like no pepperoni pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just like shocked. And you know, there's, you forget how foreign it is for a lot of people right. uh, to not understand the fact that it's like really normal for you to like not drink alcohol or not have bacon or whatever. Um, yeah. And, uh, he he was like, you know, came came in and we look, we're laughing, blah blah. And he comes in the next day and he's like, man, he's like, it would be really great for us to have like, you know, a character that like, you know, was was made for someone like you growing up. And we hmm. sort of like looked at each other at the same time and we're like, huh, can we do this? Um, and uh, we we kind of just started getting excited about it. And um, he was like, we're going back and forth. And I'm like, look, if we're gonna do this. We got to do it right. It cannot be cheesy. It cannot be forced. It can't be cliched. It's right. got to be a very grounded story about like a young girl and figuring out exactly like the thematics of it and what the, that was sort of, we figured out maybe six, seven months down the road. Um, the first thing that I really wanted to do was reach out to Willow Wilson, who um, like obviously great novelist, great comic book writer, Muslim American um, and I've wanted to work for, with her for such a long time. And we reached out to her and she thought we were crazy. Um, because you know, it's sort of exactly like how you were like, Oh, I don't know if there's an audience for that. I don't know if it's going to work. I think yeah. people go in, you say something like, oh, we want to create a Muslim superhero, blah, blah, blah. And like, it just sounds cheesy. It sounds manufactured. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the one thing that I told Willow and I was like, Willow, like you've got me and you've got you and you've got Steven like we know what we're doing and we know we're going to be able to hit it in the right spot. And if we do it right, we'll be able to get just such a huge reaction to this. Um, Cause I was not going to go in and cre- like, there was no way in the world that I was going to be able to, that I wanted to go in and um, I don't know, make, make this feel like a publicity stunt at all. Uh, right. So the biggest, the biggest test for us was trying to figure out exactly what this character's, motto was like what was her with great power comes great responsibility um and it took us a while and i think when we figured out that really fundamentally it was about this girl who wasn't really sure about herself she's sort of struggling amidst you know all of these 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 labels that she's been given trying to figure out her own identity um and then she's given this great opportunity um to become anything and be anyone and, and who does she decide to become? And that's something that we're constantly going to be confronting in every chapter of her life is, you know, yeah, sure. Now she's a superhero. Okay, great. Oh, great. Now she's, but she's also an inhuman. What does that mean? Um, she's constantly going into all these different places where she's realizing she's a part of these, these categories. And, um, she has to sort of struggle against those definitions of them and find her own. Uh, so, so I yeah, mean, so that was yeah. Mm-hmm. 
No, I'm just going to say, I mean, you know, as a, as a reader of, 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 of the book, uh, you know, what I find also, I mean, obviously this is an accidental, but the fact that she, you know, her super, one of her superpowers is the fact that she's a shapeshifter essentially, mm-hmm. which yeah. I think any, any, any one of us here certainly, uh, you know, uh, on the show today or really, you know, uh, for a lot of people, just being a different person or being able to sort of be a chameleon, as it were, depending on your environment uh, is something we, we can all relate to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. And and that was a very co- – like I remember Con- talking to you about this, like the last – I mean, spoiler alert for anyone who's not read Ms. Marvel number one. Uh, but <laughs> sorry, the, the you, last... you should have read it, folks. Yeah, yeah. Read so. it pause, and download the digital I, copy, read it. If you haven't, I don't know why you guys give a shit to talk to me or listen to me right now. <laughs> um, but uh, the last page of Ms. Marvel where she changes into Carol Danvers, um, when she gets her powers, was a real like. We thought about that, and I remember going back and forth with Willow, and Willow's like, "Man, like people are gonna get mad about this," and um, she, you know, and she was like, at first she was like, "Yeah, yeah let's do it," and then she got really nervous, and then went back. I'm like, "No," I was like, "Willow, this means something." I was like, "We have to do it. We have to, <laughs> have to do it. We have right. to make sure she puts on those blue contact lenses and dyes her hair." That's like, <laughs> my my brother did that, you know, in six when he was 15 years old, like the concept of what it means to be strong and beautiful and empowered and it looks nothing like you and thinking that that's what you need to look like. It was, mm. it, it was a statement we really, really wanted to make. Um, so yeah, de- de- definitely. I mean, Ms. Marvel has her own kind of chameleon because we are all chameleons and we still kind of are, you know, figuring right. out exactly like what you actually look like under your mask is the, the toughest struggle. Absolutely. And, and I think even just as a community, you know, just the, you, if you want to talk about sort of the American Muslim experience, which is sort of our tagline of the show, I mean, you know, we're, we're all that, that's we're all navigating that, you know, that space and, and just sort of making sense of that, of, of yeah. that, that identity. Um, but, I, you know, I want to I want to say, I, I think, and to, to the listeners who aren't familiar with the book um, and, and really, honestly, guys, folks, if you whether or not you're a comic book reader or not, I, I think it's just it's just it's just great. It's just great. It's just, a, you know, a great book to read. Um, and I say that because it, it, it is so organic. It is so natural. I don't find any of it patronizing. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, you, you sort of are dealing with not only these real issues of identity, but, you know, she makes like offhand comments about her mosque being bugged or something and you know and then (laughs) right you know like and so there's just really it's just on many many layers i think Mm -hmm. it's it it really flows very naturally Mm -hmm. so i want to commend you on that yeah um and 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 just from auto just again biographically if i could uh, you know as a father of two daughters you know trying to get my girls into comic books um you know, and, and, you know, they start, maybe start off reading like My Little Pony or something innocuous as, as that. And then just sort of to then think about, well, what can I introduce them to next mm-hmm. to have a book like Miss Marvel to sort of, you know, put in their laps is just is wonderful. So, yeah, yeah. yeah and I, thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, that was really another, you know, I've got I, well, I have 12 nephews and nieces, so I've got a big we've got a big group home at home. But my nieces and even my nephews, I mean, very much my nieces in particular, being able to create content for them. Like every time I'd go home, they'd be like, Oh, do you have any comics? And I'd be able to only give them like one thing. Right. Um, and it was sort of the, the younger Marvel heroes. And those are like specials we do every so often. There was nothing in the Marvel universe because really fundamentally too, like I want people to get excited about Marvel comics across the board. If they pick up Ms. Marvel, maybe they'll go and pick up amazing Spider-Man. Um, you know, and now maybe they'll go pick up Squirrel Girl, which is a fantastic, another fantastic book that I think we can give to like our younger readers. Um, so that's really fundamentally where it came from for us. Um, but I, you, and also, I also want to, co- Willow Wilson in particular is such a gifted uh, yeah. dialogue artist. Like she's so good at capturing yeah. um, really. like just the simplicity of like the, the human experience in such a way that's funny and endearing. Uh, you know, and I, I've got, I love working with her. It's it just collaborating with her has been such a gift and she's just, she's a wonderful human being. Um, no. And then for her to like, as a, as a, 
for being white Caucasian sort of Muslim convert yeah. for her to for her to write that again as I said organically and just so naturally dialogue of a you know of a of a Pakistan of your sort of average you know middle class working Pakistani family is yeah. just it just flows very naturally mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so no, she gets I, that's it. very commendable yeah yeah she gets it. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to, you had made a comment about sort of like just the, the, the Muslim American experience and, yeah. um, like one thing I was at a, I was invited to like, you know, we did sort of this, um, I don't know if it was a conference, but it's gathering at Harvard for like, uh, just Muslim Americans in different professions. Um, a few months, actually last year at some point, right after the Ms. Marvel announcement, Mm -hmm. And we were talking very much about sort of, you know, what can we do to change the Muslim American narrative, like what our responsibilities are and whatever. And I, I really came from that really just thinking that, you know, I think the biggest problem right now is that we don't have like we're not allowed to have pluralistic interpretations of just, I mean, Islam, but also just the Muslim American experience and mm -hmm. what it means to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of what the wall is that we're hitting is that, you know, we're talking about what it means to be a Muslim and there's like these eight definitions and everyone has to agree to those eight definitions. Right. And what's happening is that there's like Muslim American homosexuals out there and they're not allowed to be Muslim Americans. You know what I mean? Like yeah. understanding that the Muslim, like Muslims out there are so much more diverse than we realize that they are. So and talking true. about, like these pluralistic interpretations is absolutely, absolutely necessary for us to um, grow as a faith and grow as, as a people. Um, I, I just, you know, and that's something that I feel like we, we keep struggling with and we keep hitting our, halt, our, our heads against is because we think it has to be one thing. And I just don't yeah. think that's possible. Absolutely. You know, it's so, funny you say about, you know, attending a conference and sort of, you know, I, I, and I remember like it was yesterday. I mean, I remember attending a, a, a conference and this would have been, uh, I think like circa 2000. So, you know, right before, oh, I'm sorry, 2002 actually. So it was after 9-11. And, and I remember one of the, one of the panelists, uh, you know, an academic, a scholar, uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah from Chicago, you know, he made a comment about how we need our own Muslim storytellers. And I remember sitting in the audience um, and just thinking what a far-fetched idea that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's only 2002. So yeah. I think that, you know, I, I think sometimes we do forget that in, in the, you know, it, that's only 13 years ago, 14 years yeah. ago. And within that time, I think we really have come, a, you know, uh, you know, we, we really have come a far, you know, a, a long way in terms of mm -hmm. as a community and telling our stories from our own vantage point, from our own, you know, for, yeah. from, from our, our, our own sort of as, as agents of, of our own narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And it's happening a lot more now. I mean, yes. just in small ways, like even like that, that whatever you want to think about it, that sort of mip, Mipsters video of, right. you know, <laughs> somewhere in America with those Muslim hijabis, like I, whatever people's opinions are on that video, it's more about the fact that there's a Muslim American voice out there and it's becoming a lot more prominent that people Absolutely. are trying to, to share their story and share their experiences from a, a creative uh, vantage point. And um, that's going to, it's going to be happening more and more. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, you, you speak from a very interesting perspective because obviously, you know, at, certainly at Marvel, uh, you know, we've had decades of of the X Men and the and mutants, which have served as a metaphor, like a catch all metaphor for fill in the blank mm -hmm. marginalized group. Right. And so I I and obviously even even though uh, Ms. Marvel's inhuman, but it, it's the the same idea. Like I I think it's the the fact that she is a mar a marginalized group within a marginalized group, essentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, that that allows for some 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 really interesting uh, commentary potentially, you know. Yeah, I, sometimes when Will and I talk, we always joke about like how meta the story gets because of the fact that like Ms. Marvel within the the com the the Marvel within the Marvel universe, um, like her her story is very similar to sort of the actual comic book itself and people's perception of the comic book itself within sort of the larger sort of mainstream media. Um, and how, you know, it's, it was really doubted at first and people were not sure about it. And then it came out and, you know, people were like, oh my God, this is amazing. It's exciting. And then, 
you know, Will and I turned to each other and we're like, oh my God, I hope we don't screw it up now. Like just <laughs> like we're now we're at a point where we're like, oh God, we got to sustain this. Okay. How do we keep making it more interesting and just, you know, now you're, we've kind of sort of proved ourselves and now we're like, oh, don't screw it up. You know? So <laughs> it's very much going to be Kamala Khan's uh, experience within the, the Marvel universe itself too. Uh, talk about time flying. I mean, I can't believe we're on issue 13. Or issue, issue 14, I guess, next month, so uh, or in a few yeah, short oh weeks. God. Issue 14, I have to tell you guys. Uh, I mean, uh, I, always, I always get a little emotional when I read certain issues that we have. But issue 14, um, and, and it's a very different experience when you read something in, in script form. And then when it's finally right. in sort of the final stages of production, when you're reading it on the art, very different experience. But I got really emotional in issue 14 because it brought back a lot of things from my childhood. Mm. Um, and it's a little controversial. I've got <laughs> some Muslim aunties upset at me, <laughs> um, but I think it's necessary. Uh, it's going to probably get a little bit more even controversial, um, in the most innocent way possible. But I, I do think that people are going to react to that issue. Uh, pretty viscerally. So. Well, we 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 appreciate uh, the the uh, both the tease as well as the scoop. So thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, you got it right uh, here. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's right, right here, folks. Um, no, I'm a few issues behind, so uh, I'm glad you didn't spoil anything. But uh, really looking forward to it. Yeah. No, good, thank you good. for saying that. Um, I, uh, I, I was wondering if you could yeah. if you could talk a little bit about how you came up with her uh, design because what, one thing that that I really like is the fact that she has a, a a unique superhero costume that manages to be you know a modest muslim costume yeah. as well you know and and i think that i'm i'm thinking about this specifically because uh and this is i'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus but uh, you know i i saw eric larson for example just the other day just really tearing into uh, her costume design uh, and and it and again, this isn't I'm, it's not about him specifically, but I mean, obviously, he represents a point of view which is shared by many that says that a female superhero costume has to look a specific way or, if you will, show specific things. Right. Yeah. I mean, let's um, be real, right? A very overly sort of sexualized, which again, you know, as a as going back to something I said earlier, as a father of two daughters, I mean, mm -hmm. it was like, okay, what ex what what comic book do I give my daughters? You know, right. where I I, I'm, I I feel, <laughs> you know, I'm, I still feel comfortable looking them in the eye, like after they finish reading the reading the issue. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's um. Well, look, obviously, I have very strong opinions on that because uh, all of the work that I've done, I've but. Look, when I walked in, when I walked into Marvel a few years ago, I was so nervous because I was like, I'm not the typical Marvel audience and none of these books really speak to me. And I was like, I want to walk in and let people know, listen, I'm not a, I did not grow up. I'm not a big I'm not steeped, steeped into comic book continuity. And that's OK. I yeah. want to be able to create comic books for people, for everyone, for people mm -hmm. who are just like me, who want to read stories um, that are about like maybe the, the sort of the experience about growing up um, that was interesting to me. So yeah. in terms of like the costume itself and the costume design, there was no way in hell, even before Ms. Marvel, I hated, I hate the fact that we sexualize um, our female characters. I hate yeah. the fact that they think it's okay to wear breastplates and underwear and you think that's a superhero costume. I, I right. don't, I don't think that that's necessary. One and two, it's not very practical if you're a superhero to be like running around in your underwear. Um, you're not going to get much done and you'll be very self-conscious. So I think it's completely <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but also with Ms. Marvel, like I, that that in particular was a very conscious design because one I wanted it to reflect uh, Captain Marvel her 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 uh, idol um, and then also wanted to sort of reflect her heritage a little bit so the costume sort of looks like um, like a like a thong pajama like juridar and like long top uh, which is right. Which, if, if for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's just like right. a South Asian outfit with like a long shirt and like fitted pants. Um, and a scarf. Uh, so we still wanted it to look like that without it necessarily straight up being like South Asian outfit. Um, and also make sure that she was covered fundamentally because at the same, regardless of how, look, I walk around wearing sleeveless. Like I'm not a very moderate, moderate, modest Muslim in quotes. Um, sorry, dad and mom. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm I'm not, you know, I mean, that's a whole other separate conversation about what I think about, um, like sort of how women have been, Muslim women have been desexualized and made to feel shame about their bodies side conversation, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, <laughs> but specifically with her, I wanted to say like, look, this is, this is the mainstream Muslim American experience in the sense that she might not necessarily cover her head, but mm-hmm. she's modest and she doesn't sort of flaunt her, her body doesn't flaunt her skin. And she respects that. And I, and I really, and I, and I firmly respect that so much. I think that's so important. Um, so that's sort of where it came about. And I will say that that is definitely something that a lot of our creators think about now a lot, a lot more often. It's not just because Ms. Marvel is Muslim. It's because mm-hmm. you have to be able to, you know, cover your hero in a way that's, you know, respectable, um, and also strong and also still have her look beautiful. Um, yeah. and that, and I think that you can look beautiful without necessarily having your like boobs hanging out. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of where it came from. Yeah. Well, and, I, I and, seen, and, like, it, it, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, well, I, I mean, it, I, I feel like what you're talking about, I, there, there has been a perceptible shift in the conversation from the days of, I mean, like when, when I think back to like the early nineties where you certainly with, with all the image people that were coming up, you know, the, the, the standard female costume design was, as you say, you know, breastplate and underwear. Right. Uh, and, and thongs, lots of thongs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we're, we've seen a shift, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, the, those, the, the, the spider woman cover, there was a bit controversy about that, uh, uh, last fall, I think. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, just this past week, I'm sure you're aware of, you know, the, those, uh, uh, uh bat girl mm-hmm. uh, cover and, and, you know, the conversation that's ensued, I think for, certainly for me from the outside looking in has been very interesting because, uh, there seems to be a m- more of a willingness on the part of the content creators of acknowledging that, yes, the, our audience has expanded, that this yeah. is, this is not, things are not as they used to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also important to note that a lot of the, the typical female costume design was um, geared towards, catered towards, you know, the, the male sexual fantasy, um, the right. male sexual ideals of, of what women should look like for them. And now as the audience is changing, it's even more important to realize that that's, you're not, you're not catering to just that one market anymore. Um, and people forget that sometimes people in the industry who've been there for a while, who actually have the best of intentions. They're just used to seeing things a particular way. They're right. thinking this is what sells. Um, and just forgetting about the fact that the, the audience is, is increasing significantly and also diversifying simultaneously. Um, so that's really where it comes from. I think in the next few years that hopefully that those conversations won't happen as often, often, um, you won't have people, I mean, you'll always have people criticizing it because you're trying to sort of play, play in their, their space. Um, but at the same time, I, I just, I don't think that you can deny the force by which these, these new audiences have come in and, um, they want to, they want to play a place to play as well. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's going to be the norm in the next couple of years. Now, when, when we talk about how, how the audience has changed, uh, my, my sense is we could probably find, find, you know, a corollary with, uh, you know, the success of certainly Marvel Studios films, which have opened up this universe to, I mean, certainly a, a far more sizable audience that's probably uh, been loyal to the comics. I, I'm curious from, from your perspective as, as an insider, what is, what is that like? What's the byplay like between the comic side and, you know, and the, and the studio side? Well, you know, we, I mean, the studios, they're such amazing creative uh, geniuses going on on that end. So in terms of, much coordination. I think a lot of it is they're sort of lifting what publishing is doing and putting their own spin on it. Um, there's definitely, you know, obviously lots of communication going back and forth. Obviously I don't work on the studio side, so I don't want to make any assumptions or speak on their behalf at all. But I do think it's really interesting that when they decided to do Captain Marvel, they decided to do Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel. Right. I was, I was thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that says a lot about sort of what their intentions and goals are for the studio space. Um, and, 
you know, Carol Danvers as Captain Marvel only started about three years ago. And now suddenly they decided that they're going to do a movie about it. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely, you know, while they're taking a lot of content that happened maybe 10, 12 years ago, uh, it's, they're thinking um, very forward in terms yeah. of what's going to be popular, uh, what is popular, um, and sort of where the comic space is shifting. Um, at least that's what I'm sensing. And I, for me, that's very, very exciting. I mean, when they made the Captain Marvel announcement and the Black Panther announcement, I was, <laughs> it was a great day. It was a great day in comics. Yeah, well, it's it's funny because uh, I I remember watching 42, you know, the Jackie Robinson movie, and and just in my in my head I was like, man, this guy would be an amazing Black Panther. Yeah. And yeah. you know, so so the fact that they that he he was cast was 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 pretty it's excellent. Great, yeah. Mm-hmm. Not Jackie Robinson, Zucky. You mean the actor, right? They well, it's the Jackie yeah. Robinson movie. It's, 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 it's a ghost. It's a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's the future. That's the future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I mean, obviously, Captain Marvel is coming. I mean, do you anticipate uh, Kamala crossing over uh, beyond the comic book page? Well, um, I can't speak to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know I, I will I don't know what I don't know what our future plans are. I will say that we did just actually I don't know if it was announced officially yet, but by the time you air this it probably will be announced. Um the, the she they're doing uh they just created Ms. Marvel Kamala Khan in uh, a Marvel game called Puzzle Quest. Oh, okay. Um so that's going to be out re- relatively soon. We just did an announcement with MTV. So that's really exciting. Um because okay. That means that the company believe that she's a viable character. She's going to be around for a while. Uh, where she's going to go is to be seen. I strongly believe and hope that she will be in cartoons and television shows and all of that. You know, that's my that's my 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 prayer to myself uh, and to the the Marvel heads as much as I can nag them about it. But <laughs> <laughs> who knows who knows what will actually happen? But I I do strongly believe that. Um, she's become a character that is recognizable for people even outside of the comic space um, and is definitely becoming that, uh, that sort of interesting point of view character that can bring more people into comics. And I think that's very important. And I think Marvel realizes that and has really wholeheartedly uh, embraced that character. So what's to come is to be seen. And I hope, you know, inshallah, whatever is to come, I'll be able to be a part of that. So. Well, and and I mean, just to, just to, to pick up on what you just talked about, how she has sort of expanded beyond the comic page uh, in people's perceptions. I would love your thoughts on how people used Ms. Marvel uh, to essentially respond to these these anti-Muslim bus adverts, that, you know, uh, from Pamela Geller, et cetera. I mean, uh, I know I kind of like did like a like a punch in the air when I saw that because I just I love the the crossover that happened there. Mm hmm. Well, look, I mean, I can't, I can't really, um, I can't condone people doing public defacement. I think that's a whole other issue in terms of, uh, I think Mar- that's something that Marvel, uh, very much opposes. Um, but you know, fundamentally, uh, Kamala Khan and Ms. Marvel has become like this symbol of tolerance and love. And I think that's really fundamentally what, I want it to be about, you know, I don't, I, we don't want this character to be, uh, you know, an, an, an aggressive statement. We want it to be very much about, um, the fact that she's representative of a population that is misunderstood. Yeah. Um, and she happens to also want to help people no matter who they are and what they are. Um, and that's really what I'm more focused on. I'm more focused on the fact that, this character is meaningful for a lot of people. And that's really wonderful. Like I, that I did not expect. I did not understand. I did not expect how, how much it would sort of hit them in the guts and in the hearts. Um, and that's sort of where I want that character to go. We really want that character to be sort of representative of um, these larger messages of love and tolerance and respect. Um, So, you know, it's, beyond that you know obviously i can't i can't comment <laughs> much uh because it gets a little bit complicated right right <laughs> of course no yeah um well your picture terms obviously 
Yeah, Sorry? we want to give you a chance to to talk up some other stuff. Uh, well, we we want to give you a chance to talk up uh, some of the other stuff that's coming up at Marvel. I know that you're in the midst of this uh, the Secret Wars initiative. I'd love if you could uh, give us uh, the elevator pitch on that. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I got it. Sometimes I accidentally give away too much, so I'm going to be very very brief <laughs> and very simple. Uh, Secret Wars is basically. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a, a big event where all of our uh, all of our storylines sort of collide, literally, um, and where uh, you're going to be a part of an interestingly new Marvel universe uh, with uh, sort of all of the elements like of your childhood that you loved growing up. Um, if you're reading Marvel comics as a as a young kid, um, it's uh, sort of a microcosm of all of these really big uh, Marvel events brought together and all these different interpretations of your favorite characters. Um, and it's sort of a lot of events have brought us to this point, this boiling point, um, so that uh, sort of in some senses uh, the bad guy wins um, and our heroes have to combat that and how they get through this um, and try to protect sort of uh, all of these universes that have come together uh, is sort of going to be the journey of this story. Um, I have to say uh, a lot of the books that we have coming out are books that I wish we were able to do like even 10 years ago. This is sort of uh, just if you're a fanboy or fangirl, there's something for everyone in this event. Um, and personally, I'm excited. Uh, Ms. Marvel in particular is going to be telling the last her 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 series is very much about the last days on earth, um, which is going to be Mm -hmm. more a culmination of everything that she's experienced for the last year. Um, and how that comes together when the world is coming to an end and how she reacts. Um, and, uh, that, that is something that, uh, we're going to have a pretty great team up that people have been waiting for, for a long time. Um, and for our other series, Captain Marvel, uh, is, uh, our series is called Captain Marvel and the Carol Corps, which is an homage to the Carol Corps, who are the big Captain Marvel fans. Um, and it's going to be at right. Carol Danvers and uh, a, a fighter pilot squad of women um, and sort of their their story within Secret Wars. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be amazing. I highly recommend it. Uh, something for everyone. And it kicks off, what, next month? Where are we? <laughs> I, I, I believe so. Yeah. You, you, might not, you might know that. I should know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you know one of my like definitive memories of my childhood is the original Secret Wars and all the action figures and the you know uh, yeah I mean gosh that's that's just one of those things that hit me at exactly the right age when I was a kid so yeah so this uh, will this will but, definitely be that it's even bigger than that so 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 whether a fan of the comics or the movies you name it you should find something that you'll like in here absolutely absolutely. Nice. Well, as as we sort of wrap things up here, um, I want to give you a chance to uh, let people know where where they can find you online. Obviously, uh, uh, certainly the, the check out your your uh, the the, Mar- the Marvel books that you talked up. But if sure. people want to find you, uh, where can they? Sure. So um, I'm still editing uh, Captain Marvel, Ms. Marvel, Hawkeye, uh, Rocket Raccoon, um, and Daredevil. Um, nice. Simultaneously, you can find me uh, on. Twitter at mini B six twenty two, which there's a whole backstory to that name, by the way. So, um, but uh, I was curious <laughs> yeah, when I saw that. I mean, you don't have to get into it, but I, yeah, I was like, that's yeah, that's got to be a conscious choice. Yeah. It, it, well, my my mentor has given me that nickname, and she's great okay. in comics, so it's gonna stay. <laughs> um, yeah, mini B six twenty two, and uh, my oh, the Tumblr, Ms. Marvel Tumblr, all new Ms. Marvel. Uh, tumblr.com uh, check it out has all of sort of the, the sneak peeks of what's to come uh, sometimes I write commentary on it um, I'm trying to do a little bit more postings um, similar to my letters pages in the tumblr uh, so just to have more dialogue with people um, and then I am on Facebook Sana Amanit uh, although if people do want to message me there uh, I apologize I don't check it that often I usually ask people to go through Marvel PR to get in touch or my tweets or my, or my Twitter. So. 
Well, there we go. Well, well, Sana, thank you so much yeah. for, for, for chatting with us. That, like I said, this, this was, uh, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while just to kind of fanboy out over a lot of this stuff. So <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and a shout-out to our previous guest, or, or one of our past guests, Wajahat Ali, who sort of brought us all uh, together. So, yeah. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> so, great, yeah. Thanks, Waj. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, Sana, for coming on. We're, we're looking forward to what's coming up with Ms. Marvel, and uh, we're hoping you'll get to join us again sometime. Absolutely. I would love it. Thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. So many thanks uh, for Sana, uh, to Sana for joining us. And as we wrap things up, I wanted to read a listener letter here that we got uh, in regards to our interview with uh, Wajahat Ali, who we alluded to at the very end of that episode. And this is this is from Raza, who, uh, referring to our conversation with Wajahat a few months ago, said, The podcast I've been waiting for has arrived. This podcast was a rollicking hour and 20 minutes of humor, insight, analysis, and free-flowing dialogue. Diffuse congruence at its best. Rock on. But he goes on. I've been a fan of Wajahat's work for a while, as he's one of the most talented writers of not just our community, but in any community. I've read The Domestic Crusaders, The Fear, Inc. Report, The Pilot for MJ, his essay on helping a couple escape the foreclosure of their home, as well as his various articles submitted to the Huffington Post and Salon. He's one of the Muslim community's best spokespersons in getting our narrative out there, showing people that we're normal human beings with hopes, aspirations, fears, and insecurities, just like anyone else. He's a great example of someone who shows that being a practicing Muslim and a born and bred Westerner aren't mutually exclusive identities. So in many ways, that picks up on some of what we were talking with Sana about, about yeah, how identities yeah, intersect yeah. and overlap. So th- thank you, Raza, for that. And, and I'm sure uh, Wajah uh, appreciates those kind words as well. And, and yeah, we're, we're very lucky to have him on. And certainly I, I, I consider myself very lucky to, to have him as a friend. So we'll, yeah, we'll, you know, it, it was. I think the last episode, Zucky, you were talking about sort of uh, the kind of uh, or, or just the various guests that we've had, and we've been able to sort of weave this tapestry. Um, and I think that 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 remains true not only when it comes to sort of Islam in America or the personal narratives uh, of, of folks you know involved in the community here in the Bay Area, but also just uh, I think we've had now our share of people who are out there uh, telling our stories. And certainly people like Rabia, Chaudhary, um, you know, Sana uh, and Wajahat and, uh, you know, many, many others uh, are, are part of that sort of tapestry, if you will. Well, and, and you know, I mean, I think that when when sort of the when we when we look back at uh, the story of, of, of Muslims in America and, and and this process of getting Muslim narratives out there, uh, I I absolutely firmly believe that the domestic crusaders will occupy a very pivotal role in that timeline, uh, because in many ways it really did, by virtue of its uh, positioning, chronological or just or its example, it really did lead to many other uh, things happening. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, you know, it was fun. For, it was it was uh, it was interesting when we were having our conversation with Sana. Um, you know, one of the questions that I didn't really get to, or because I didn't really know how to sort of uh, articulate it, I think. But uh, now that we're having this conversation on the side. Um, when we talk about the American Muslim experience, you know, it's very easy to sort of take your own set of experiences and sort of universalize them and think that, well, not only is that true for, uh, you know, all Muslims, but all, you know, say Muslims who immigrated from South, from South Asia, what have you. But just anecdotally, I can't help but think that just thinking of me and my friends and the people I grew up with, but, um, you know, comic books and that just... I guess the the uh, how do I describe it, Zucky? But just you know the uh, I guess the cultural you know you know like basically everything about comic books, not just the the actual medium, the print medium itself, was such the a part of our lives. And the- yeah, the characters, the mythos. There you go. Sure, the there you mythology go. was such a part of our lives growing up, and so to have her. You know, I think, you know, to have Sana sort of talk about how, you know, that mythology and the characters represented in it uh, are meant to be uh, the uh, reification of the best of our, you know, the best of us, as it were. Right. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, when I was a kid growing up, my favorite superhero was Spider-Man. 
And uh, my my kids, you know, they they still love Spider Man. And and I was I, was, I had dinner with a friend yesterday, and uh, I had mentioned that you know Spider Man even today is uh, by a, a wide margin the most successful superhero in terms of merchandising and 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 uh, uh, toys and things like that sold all over the world, right? And and he asked me, he was like, why is that? You know, and I and I I thought about it for a second, but I don't. I think what it comes down to is the fact that. Anybody can put on that mask and become Spider-Man. Mm. Doesn't matter what you look like. That's right. That's right. And for those, you know, again, of our listeners who don't sort of follow the comic book universe of those of these characters, uh, you know, the uh, the sort of genetic mutation that is now represented in the movies, where yeah, or certainly in the uh, Sam Raimi films, uh, and know the character only from movies, for example. Um, that's that's relatively new in the comic book. He devises that's a mechanical right. device, uh, and and he is sort of this mechanically gifted uh, teenager who devises those uh, contraptions that spit out the webs, that shoot out the webs. So it's not a genetic alteration, right? So very much, yeah. So so very true to what you're saying, yeah. It's. I mean, I I think it it, go, it absolutely goes to something, and and I think. Um, the fact that we're in an age now, and this is something I talk about more on my other podcast, obviously, but um, that's the movie film podcast, by the way. Look it up on iTunes. Um, hey, cross pollination. In, in this case, perhaps a little bit of self pollination. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, any any chance I have, uh, I, it it speaks to the ability of of marginalized communities as i mentioned on the show to find something they can relate to i think it's very telling you know there there there's the, the movie x2 which is the second x men movie and th- that came out in 2003 and there's a scene in there where the character and you know what i'm talking about professor the, the character iceman tells his parents that he's a mutant yeah and that's meant to be an allegory for like a coming out scene yeah and yet uh, I remember seeing it with my wife. Well, at the time she was my fiance, and she was like, "It's like he, be- it's like he told his parents he became Muslim." Mm, right. You know, and, and and what to me, there's this idea of of within the 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 specificities of this scenario, you can achieve a kind of universality where, you know, uh, the mutant becomes a surrogate for X, Y, and Z. You know, and and um, we all feel like mutants to some extent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. And, and, uh, in addition to that, uh, wanted to take the opportunity to thank our listeners again for not only sending in, uh, continuous feedback, uh, but continuing to listen. We had a very good response from, um, our last episode with Imam Zaid. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been fantastic, and uh, we we appreciate uh, not only the response to these episodes, but but the response to overall what what we're uh, trying to achieve with the show. Yeah, and continue to do so. And uh, obviously, you guys know where you can find us: um, uh, diffusecongruence at gmail dot com. We have a Facebook page. Uh, Zucky, where can people find you? Of course. Well, I'm I'm online. I'm at Zucky's Corner. That's the AKIS Corner, and also at the Huffington Post, where my movie reviews go up regularly, as well as this show, as well as the Movie Film Podcast. You can also find us on Facebook. That's Facebook.com/slash Diffuse Congruence. And uh, let us know how we're doing. Hit up iTunes. Hit up Stitcher Radio. Write us a review. Leave a star rating. Uh, everything that you say that lets us know how we're doing helps us continue to try to provide content that you all will appreciate. We hope. Absolutely. And, and with that, on behalf of my co-host and friend, Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zaki Hassan. This is Diffused Congruence. We'll see you next month. Thanks for listening.